Yes, good morning, everyone. So I'm very pleased to welcome you on this session where we'll be talking about uh, an important topic for us, which is uh, responsible technology. Uh, I think the, the sound is not good. Huh? No? The sound is not good? No, they say that they don't hear. Can you hear any of us? Hello? No. Hello, hello? No? Can we put the sound uh, a little bit? Uh, yeah, I know, but I won't stay like this. <laughs> no, it's better now. Okay, it's better now? Yes. It's okay? Okay, super. So, welcome you in this session. We will be talking about um, responsible technologies, and more precisely about responsible artificial intelligence. And even more precisely, we will be talking about artificial intelligence, which is gender fair. Um, why? What does it mean to be responsible? What does it mean to be gender fair? Uh, and why it matters, and also how we can do it, how we can incentivize it. So that's what we'll be talking about uh, in this session. My name is Marine Raberin. I am uh, in charge of uh, developing the business uh, for Lenovo in Middle East Africa and Eastern Europe. But the reason I'm here today is probably more related to the different initiatives that I'm leading. Uh, the first one is um, you know, a global initiative internally at Lenovo, which is called Women and AI which aims to make Lenovo lead by example in this area. And the second is um, the fact that I'm leading a group of 40 people from 16 companies in the uh, STEM industry, uh, which produce a pledge, um, pledge for responsible and gender fair AI, and the NGO is called Cercle Interrel. Um, and I'm also part of the Women's Forum, uh, Women for AI Daring Circle. So, as you can see, it's a topic that I care a lot. And the reason why I'm so happy to have uh, you both on stage with me, great speakers, so let me introduce them. Uh, first of all, Silvia Condiani. Hello, Silvia. You are the CEO of uh, Microsoft Italy. So Microsoft um, uh, in Italy help you know, the uh, private and public organization to accelerate the digital transformation, uh, but also promote locally um, the development of uh, digital competencies, uh, also the development of an ecosystem which fosters innovation in Italy and also make sure that um, it, fo it fosters Italian competitiveness. Um, you are also a strong advocate for women empowerment, uh, for um, diverse and inclusive workplace. You have been uh, a fond the founder of uh, the association called Valoredi, if mm -hmm. I'm saying well, it right. Uh, which is, you know, which purpose is exactly this, you know, empowering women and um, make, um, develop a, a diverse workplace. And I, I think we can say that uh, you are a role model for many students, girls and women, especially in uh, the technology industry. Yes. So thanks for being here, Sylvia. Thank you. Thank you. And um, uh, Olivier Michely. Hello, Olivier. Uh, also very pleased to, to, to welcome you here. You are the CEO of um, uh, Data4. So Data4 is uh, uh, large, the largest independent European player in the data center industry. Um, so you are based, uh, so you are French and European investor uh, through 23 data centers across Europe. Would it be in France, Italy, Spain, Luxembourg, Poland? I exactly. think that's it. Yeah. Um, and uh, Olivier, you are also very involved um, uh, for, for um, around diversity, as you are the president of France Data Center, which is an association of data center actors. Um, and um, one of the key um, goals of this, uh, of this uh, association is to attract female talent. So thanks for being here today. Thanks. So my first question to you and uh, for the audience. Uh, why was it important for you to be here and to champion this topic about responsible artificial intelligence. Sylvia. Okay, then I start. Uh, the first thing is that AI is a great opportunity for uh, our country, our economy. Uh, a recent study was saying that uh, the impact for Italy alone of uh, introducing more AI in the business is something like 17 billion. So that means the way it can really transform uh, the way we do business, so we serve our citizens uh, in the public administration is massive. Um, and, uh, and not just for business purposes. I mean, we saw what uh, AI can do, for example, to introduce uh, 
um, new um, medicines for the vaccine or for uh, even um, uh, finding the cure for cancer or even, even very important now for sustainability, for finding ways to reduce emissions, you know, solving problems that would not be solvable otherwise. So that's why it is important to introduce AI. But at the same time, of course, AI poses some challenges because it um, creates, uh, it can create a sort of a black box where um, you um, uh, watch what has been happening in the past and you give uh, uh, indications of what to do in the future, but that could also lead to biases, so to reinforcing biases. So it's important to understand that it's a great opportunity. We uh, we need to embrace it, we want to embrace it, but we need to make sure that uh, it's uh, a responsible AI and it's a, a, a human-centered AI. So it's an AI that ultimately helps people uh, to be our best. And so this is uh, the, the domain of understanding uh, how can we make ethical decisions about AI? How can we have an AI that is really inclusive of, of everyone and benefits uh, all of us? Mm -hmm. So that's uh, why I'm passionate Thank about you, that. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. Olivier? Yeah, for, from my perspective, I mean, being here, uh, for me, it's, it's very important. It's to learn, to improve, and to support the theme of uh, this forum. Uh, as you said, we're building data centers uh, all across uh, Europe which is really at the convergence of two sectors, real estate construction and digital, which are very male intensive. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so therefore, by coming here, you know, we learn from the different discussion, from the experience, the best practices mm -hmm. to improve. And I like what I heard here yesterday about being offensive and not just defensive. Mm -hmm. For sure, in the digital industry, you have a uh, lower female. Uh, in basically in the people that are growing and, and progressing in the digital. However, we can be offensive, mm -hmm. and that's why coming here will help us to improve. And regarding the support, I think it's, uh, you, know, you know, digital is everywhere. Every aspect of our life is going through a digital transformation, is impacted by the digital. Therefore, it's not um, sustainable Mm -hmm. to have only male developing the apps and the software that are changing our world. So therefore being here is to support the uh, mm. gender uh, equality and as well the inclusion of women that we're supporting very strongly in our company. And we'll talk about that in a minute a lot. So um, thanks for this introduction. So, you know, as you represent also your, your, your companies, we understand that organizations like ours, you know, can uh, can play a role in the development and the usage of uh, responsible and gender fair AI. F from your perspective, which are the key principles um, to, to, for, for AI to be responsible? Uh, and maybe illustrate from your company what your company is doing. So I can start. Um, in this domain, I think we've been experimenting uh, certainly internally. Um, but then we also tried to take a, 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 an open view, collaborating with uh, uh, ethicists, uh, uh, other NGO associations, the civil society, to really understand what should be the principles that we should uh, uh, found AI on. And um, for example, just a couple of years ago, before the pandemic, we signed this uh, Rome AI um, call for ethics with the Vatican and a number of organizations, including, for example, the um, EU and the um, uh, FAO, so the food organization, and other technology companies. So the idea is really to find a common ground that the entire ecosystem believes in. And these principles are, if you want, quite general, things like uh, um, AI needs to be fair, it needs to be inclusive, it needs to work, so reliability if you think about a self-driving car, it needs to, be, to respect privacy, security. But at the foundation there are two, um, let's say, important characteristics. So one is that it needs to be transparent. So you need to understand what comes in and what comes out and why. Uh, and so, so that you can audit uh, the models themselves and think whether um, they might have some biases. Uh, and second, you need to have accountability. 
because at a certain point, uh, you know, machines uh, can, do, can take decisions, but if uh, something gets wrong, who is accountable? How mm -hmm. do you place the accountability? And so I think that uh, having a reflection um, around prin these principles uh, is uh, a good starting point. Then they are quite high up, and I'm sure we will delve into how to make them practical, because uh, nothing is effective if it doesn't get uh, practical as well. But I think that in terms of the vision, as I said, it's really about uh, setting up uh, the right tools and governance so that when we get AI to help us uh, solve the diff difficult problems, uh, um, we do it in a way that is uh, uh, human-centered, so that it really helps uh, us as humans, as mm -hmm. a society. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Silvia. Um, Olivier? Yeah, so, so on the data flow perspective, we're more a user than a producer of, uh, of uh, AI. Uh, but just to come back on your question about responsible technology, AI, algorithms, whatever the term you want to use, uh, it's quite broad, actually, mm -hmm. because a responsible technology, from my perspective, needs to be reliable, it needs to be safe, it needs to be ethical, it needs to be efficient, sustainable. So you see it's quite uh, uh, broad, uh, broad aspects. And what the data center which hosts the data we're using uh, uh, every day and the apps we're using every day, what the data center can do. So first, it needs to be safe. Because obviously the uh, uh, um, artificial intelligence applications use data the data they're using, we need to be sure that uh, it is safe, it is co correct, coherent. So that's the first, uh, I would say, aspect of the data center be uh, to act as a safe. Um, secondly, I would say the data center needs to be what I call nearshore, or sometimes we say edge data center, so to be as close as possible from the end users uh, for quality perspective, but as well uh, about data localization. And it's not protectionist at all, but it's any country being Italy, being France, Spain, the US, China, Japan, whatever country needs to have their own data center because you don't want to rely on a third party to access the apps, the application, and the data when you need it. So um, I would say localization, near shore data centers are very important and obviously sustainable. And just as an example, because I think it's, uh, it's good to, uh, to give example how we use AI in our mm -hmm. company. Actually, we use artificial intelligence for two main reasons. One is to provide predictive maintenance. Instead of being reactive, we are proactive to detect the technical issues before they are, they are happening to make sure our data centers are always available. And as well, since uh, three years, we, have, uh, work, we are working on a very uh, interesting program on how we can use the data from the data center. And actually in a data center you have thousands of sensors that we're collecting the data from them and actually we're using these data to provide environmental uh, KPIs to know how much water we're using, what electricity we are <coughs> consuming, the impact in terms of carbon, rare metals, etc. for our usage but as well the usage of our customers to make sure they can have uh, mm -hmm. an impact. And that's a very good example of how we can also leverage AI for more sustainability, diversity. We'll come to that in a minute, but that's a, a positive usage of uh, AI, uh, a good example. So from what you just said, there is one thing I like from what you said, Olivier, is when you talk about sovereignty of data, and it's true that data and the quality of the data is key especially when we talk about gender bias. We'll come to that in a minute. And also what I like from what you said, Sylvia, the collaboration, the, the ecosystem, the consensus that we need to find around those key principles which will be there to guide us through you know, uh, the right way to uh, produce and use AI. So thanks for, for your comments. There is another one that I would like to, to refer that I think is part of uh, the Microsoft uh, um, uh, re, um, principle is the Inclusiveness, if I'm not mistaken. And that's, you know, uh, very important because that's uh, something we will talk about now. Um, the impact on, for women, the impact uh, of uh, artificial intelligence, does it bring um, more, you know, help to be uh, more inclusive or, or, the, or the contrary? And, and, um, and the example that we see in our society right now are more about to say that AI can reproduce gender bias or even amplify it. So we need to be careful about that. And I will give you some examples just to illustrate 
the consequence about you know, uh, potential AI which are not gender fair. Um, first example in the field of human resources, for example. I pay attention to the microphone. Um, th there were some uh, experiment, experimental AI solution which was discriminating uh, female resume. So the, the female CV were just out due to the artificial intelligence. Um, in the online translation tools, uh, the solution sometimes struggle to represent the real place of women in certain profession and will only offer male translation. Another example is on the finance, uh, the field of finance, where you know, we have example of lower credit thresholds, which has been allocated to women versus men for the same type of situation, professional situation. Um, so we have many examples like this one, and maybe what I would like is um, uh, make a reference to the great job which has been done by uh, Eagle Berkeley, um, who is maintaining a list of all those uh, cases of discrimination, not only against women, but also against women. So that's pretty, we learn a lot when we look at those, uh, at those examples. So how to tackle it practically? Um, uh, to make it, uh, you know, to make it concrete, uh, I told you before the Cercle Interrel uh, launched a pledge, which is presenting seven key uh, principles or, let's say, recommendations to overcome gender bias. I will name it, and then we can comment. The first one is governance, strong governance, and you talked about it uh, already, Sylvia. Compliance by design, data selection and processing. Data is super key. In that, in that field. How the algorithms are defined. How do we monitor what the AI become over time? So the monit monitoring and evaluation. Who is creating um, AI? So the, the, the diversity of the AI team. And last but not least, awareness and accountability. So who is responsible and make sure that everyone takes his part. So, um, maybe a comment on, on, on those principles, maybe, maybe with, uh, with you, Olivier. Um... Yeah, um, well, the example you gave on the mortgages is a very good example. Um, I mean, we tend to transfer our cognitive bias to algorithms. Uh, that's, uh, that's crystal clear. So the artificial intelligence application usage tools use a lot of data. And basically, in these data they are using, in this massive amount of data they are using, if you have a bias, then it will influence uh, the decision. So it's super important when, you talk, when you, we talk about artificial intelligence to address those bias. And the question uh, actually we need to ask ourselves is, is the tool that we're developing has a bias. Is there a gender bias in, in the tool we are using? And if so, we need obviously uh, to address it. And so that's why it's super important in the teams that are developing AI applications and tools to have a good balance between male and female. Otherwise, you will have only the angle of one segment of the population, which are basically the men, the, the male. So obviously it needs to be addressed. And there is, one, um, there is one survey analysis that has been done by Deloitte Women in AI that I really recommend. It's mm -hmm. super uh, easy to read and it's simple and it's crystal clear. What they say is uh, f with uh, the teams where, where you have a good balance between male and female, actually in uh, the teams that are developing AI applications, actually the tools uh, are better designed and actually you have more functionalities. So that's why it's super important to have this diversity. Again, not to let one segment to, uh, develop, uh, mm. to develop AI applications. Sylvia, yeah. thanks. Uh, no, uh, well said. And uh, you know, I always give examples that if, uh, they, if Microsoft had had to choose uh, the country manager for Italy, given uh, the previous data, they would have never chosen me. <laughs> because uh, you know, women uh, are only 3% of the CEOs right, in Italy. So, um, it's important to be able to detect where the bias can be in the data and understand if you want to change things or just uh, reproduce what's been happening in the past, right? 
Um, and so uh, back to the, this is the fairness principle and design principle. And then I, now we have uh, the tools uh, that uh, help us to audit uh, the AI models, mm. because I think that uh, the principle without the tools mm. would be yeah. nothing, right? So the ability, it's important that the way that we um, um, design and model uh, the algorithm allows us to see what comes in, so what are the variables, and therefore how the decisions are made, and then we can challenge the variables um, and, uh, and understand if maybe what we are observing, it's not a causality, but it's a, a correlation, because maybe, you know, uh, um, or if there are some other uh, factors that uh, derive what we've, that uh, cause what we've been observing. So um, back to what uh, you were saying uh, in your pledge, I think that's also part of what we observed on ourselves and that we propose to our customers. So it's important to have uh, awareness of what the mm. issues can be at all levels. We have trainings, for example, on uh, AI principles for all the employees uh, at Microsoft. Um, then have a governor so that these kind of decisions get looked at and uh, uh, observed and discussed. Um, and, uh, um, with the, and we challenge each other, you know, so we have, for example, an ethical committee within the company where we bring this certain type of um, uh, design or product decision that, uh, you know, uh, can, uh, can create issues. And I think that we always need to consider that it's not only fighting bias, but also creating positive uh, inducement. And uh, there was a question before on inclusiveness uh, mm -hmm. um, and disability. And uh, it is true that AI can be a very, can be a very strong uh, facilitator on the inclusion. And uh, we started um, a very strong um, uh, push towards inclusive design in all of our products. And uh, this push, by the way, benefits everyone because uh, maybe uh, the site titles in the team's call, you know, were useful for deaf people, but in the end they are useful for everyone <laughs> when uh, maybe you're not a native speaker of the language, for example. So um, the principle is important. I think it's important to have awareness of where the problem can stem from and therefore uh, mm. work on the right tools and governance and uh, to be able also to continue uh, challenging yourself, not just before, but even after, to see if maybe sometimes uh, the models that you put in place uh, are evolving in a good or in a bad uh, direction. Yeah, yeah. And I can only comment on what you said related to the governance and maybe share with you what we are doing at, at Lenovo. Uh, we also have um, uh, an internal committee, which is uh, independent, called the PDO for Product Diversity Office which is there, you know, to, which, which is used as an ethical committee as, a, as a, in Microsoft to, to, to make sure that all the product and solutions that we are designing and proposing to our customer are inclusive, uh, so adapted to all type of customers, uh, and, um, and, and, and make sure that they are responsible and gender fair, especially when it comes to AI. And, and those ethics committee, like ours, like probably yours, can have a veto right. So it can, it can say that if we don't feel like uh, we, are guarantee, we are accountable for the, uh, for the uh, solution that we are proposing, the, pro the product just go don't go, and we just rework it. So it's very important to have an independent committee internally to guarantee the accountability uh, and the transparency uh, of, uh, of the tool that we are pro proposing. Um, Sylvia, I know that uh, in the field of uh, attracting or oh, make sure that we have more diverse team, I think also Microsoft have a great partnership and concrete action also uh, in that area. Yeah, we also heard in the previous panel how important is the skills because uh, a skills component, uh, you know, technology without people that can really leverage it is nothing. Uh, and so there is uh, a, an emergency or an urgency to get enough people with the right skills. We heard mm -hmm. it uh, many times. Just in Italy, at the moment, there are 150,000 jobs that cannot be covered uh, in the IT sector because there are not enough people with the right skills. And so and in the same country where we have uh, unemployment and especially um, you know, even for graduate, for uh, young people, unemployment, it's uh, almost 30%. So it's really a waste of talent that we cannot afford. It's gonna get worse. <laughs> it's gonna get worse because there's this, the increase in the number of jobs in the tech space is uh, even more. 
And in the, within this uh, overall uh, skill shortage, uh, there is a greater, even greater gender uh, imbalance versus uh, the normal uh, business world. So we heard, uh, you know, only 20%, at least in Italy, only 20% of people go to university, and out of them, only 20% go to STEM. So it's very, very small. Uh, and uh, and uh, out of those, uh, really, um, the women representation is, uh, again, 20%. <laughs> so, Really, these are the jobs uh, you know, um, that are going to define how we develop new products, new services, uh, um, meritocratic companies, a lot of opportunities, and women are not taking those uh, careers. Um, and we can discuss why is that, maybe because it's also because of stereotypes and biases. Role model, uh, I think it's also. The importance yeah. of role modeling, that it's not for nerds, but it's uh, you know, for people who want to get uh, uh, have an impact in uh, the, the role of our companies and uh, to, to create a different society. So there is a lot about orientation and role model. So what we have been doing is to create uh, um, alliances with our partners, uh, with our customers, uh, to train more people. So in the last year alone, uh, with Microsoft, uh, we tra digitally trained 1.5 million people, so that's massive. A different level, maybe more, you know, level 100, but just to start having some basic knowledge of what digital is and how it works and how it can complement. But we also um, got uh, almost 20,000 people to be certified. So that's already much more. So it means that you go through certain levels, so you get to level quite advanced. And then we have academies, we, again, with some of our partners and universities to reskill people because that's the other you know, emergency, you know, people that are um, losing the edge in the labor market. So this is key, and we have a specific, um, let's say, twist to try to attract more females in those things. And so it's a, it's a long story, but what we create is it's kind of a module which is an AI school where we try to get, you know, girls from... Uh, um, uh, the um, secondary school uh, to try to see with how with the AI they can solve the simple problems in their life in their you know uh, neighborhood and this is important because you get a, a, a little sense of what, how AI works but more importantly you understand why it's important and we've seen that you know girls that go through these camps have a much higher likelihood to go into STEM uh, afterwards. So there is a lot to, to do. Let's say we are now try, really getting to understand what works, and I think it's really the moment now to get more of a nationwide initiatives in coalition with many different companies and uh, uh, university to really scale it faster because we don't have time to waste. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, related to the, to the diversity of AI team, so what I get from you is there is a clear objective of attracting women, educating, retaining also talent, which is uh, another story, right? Because once, uh, you know, we, there is also ladies uh, uh, moving out of STEM in the middle career. And, and I think that's one of the, uh, of the things that uh, we may discuss now because um, I was about to ask you, what is the level of maturity um, of, to address, you know, gender bias, to apply those recommendation, uh, would it be in general or in your own companies? And I think um, what, I, what I would like also to share with the audience is what we can do already, so what is done, but also where we struggle, because we do struggle, you know, otherwise we won't be there. So could you, could you share our experience and maybe Olivier on your side? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the net zero gender gap, uh, if I may, is a little bit like the net zero carbon emission. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we all agree that uh, the awareness is okay, the desire is here. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, as has been stated yesterday, we need to act. We need to move forward mm. and we need to take actions. Mm. Um, so I think we need to perhaps uh, separate uh, the large and multinationals to the SMEs, uh, small and medium enterprises, because in large and in multinationals, I think it will be they have more, uh, you know, power uh, means to basically put that in motion. Right. I'm not saying it's easy, but I think they have uh, more power basically to do it. 
Um, however, in small and in medium enterprises, that's where it's more difficult. And actually, just take the, um, the title of HR director. So in large enterprises, you have HR director. Now in multinational, you have chief staff officer. Mm -hmm. And then if you're lucky in small and medium enterprises, you have a, a head of or head, uh, someone responsible of uh, personnel, of uh, human resources, or it's the financial director, <laughs> which is cost driven. And let's not forget that in mm -hmm. Italy, in, in Europe, in the US, the majority of the companies are not the multinationals, mm. it's the small and medium enterprises. Correct. So I don't know, Chiara, or uh, for the Women Forum, perhaps you have addressed it, so I'm sorry. Uh, but it's perhaps something to address is how to, uh, what is the level of maturity and how we can take it further mm. in the small and medium enterprises. Um, so at the data four level, uh, I think it's what we hear yesterday, we address it quite well, I would say in the N minus one, so the uh, management board level, we are very proud to have a 50-50. Mm -hmm. But now when you go further, when you go to the N minus two, N minus three, it's more difficult. If you look at the employee level, I mean, the, uh, uh, I, I knew that in, for example, in the French engineering schools, uh, you have only, uh, I thought we had about 20% 20, 20 of uh, women and actually in France and the uh, CTO of Société Générale told me actually we are 12% mm. in France. So I'm not sure it represents the whole Europe. So, you know, to have a balance between male and female in the technology, in digital, is already very difficult. Mm. And as uh, Sylvia said, uh, we need to address uh, education. We need to inspire. So Sylvia, I think you're a very good example, but there are plenty of other uh, female example where it's super important to explain how the technology is transforming the world, uh, how the woman needs to be involved, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the fact that and it's a super interesting job, and it's well paid. It's well paid. It's well paid. So, uh, mm -hmm. And I think all these yeah. things need to be you know, infused, right. and it's a message as well to the governments uh, mm -hmm. and to the J20. It's how we take actions to take uh, the problem at, uh, at the root cause mm -hmm. and infuse into the schools and in the education the importance to have as well uh, ladies, girls, into uh, technology. Yeah, yeah. And that's not scripted, but I want to say, because we were discussing yesterday with the CEO and we thought maybe that we should uh, put an incentive for schools and for universities mm -hmm. that if they, mm -hmm. for uh, every you know, woman that they get, they have, I don't know, 50% more, uh, you know, the, the universities get uh, mm -hmm. a per student, uh, you know, contribution from the state. Maybe if it's uh, STEM and it's mm -hmm. a woman, you should, they should get at least 50% more. <laughs> because, you know, I think there needs to be really, as you say, an action to, to, to make an impact and change. I like this, uh, this idea because it also linked to one of the proposals from the Women's Forum, which is around how do we incentivize. So I like, you know, this type of uh, incentivization and incentivization. Yeah. And I think it's the same that we could apply to, to, to companies. And that's, uh, that's a proposal from the Women's Forum is, you know, instead of going too much into um, regulation, that what the government could do is, you know, to, to, to reward the effort with credit tax. So when a company lead by example, demonstrate that uh, they take action, concrete action to, 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 to tackle this topic, they can be rewarded. So what do you think about it? And what do you think about the regulation in general, the label as well? We see a lot of label created. What is your view on that? Uh, the idea of the um, proposal that uh, has been put on the table of the G20, I think is good in a sense that uh, uh, it shows what is the way ahead, uh, that is, uh, uh, companies need to adopt AI, but they mm. also need it to do, um, to do it in a way that is responsible. So they need to put in place the systems to monitor, to control, to govern what is getting produced so that it's uh, equitable and fair and inclusive. Um, uh, it is true that uh, there is going to be uh, some challenge for the small businesses, I agree with mm. that. So. Um, uh, the tax credit can be an incentive, but it will need to go through together with, uh, again, uh, skilling, because uh, um, I think that the large companies are all starting to reason about that and adopt this kind of uh, tools. For the small, medium business, it's going to 
it, we are kind of far. Yeah, yeah. But, you know. Olivier, about regulation level. Well, well it's, it's sorry. It's, it's, we are already in, a, in, a, in an activity which is highly regulated. So adding another uh, you know, regulation, I would say, uh, I'm, but I have a mixed feeling. Because uh, on one side, uh, I think uh, give, you know, give example, give uh, meaning, etc., is much more powerful than uh, impose and regulate. And I truly believe that uh, in the virtuous circle, where basically uh, you, know, you, you adopt uh, the right principle, gender equality, inclusion of women, it will be well perceived internally, it will create value, it will be known inside and outside of the company, mm -hmm. you will attract. So I think it's much more, I'm more in favor. But at the same time, and I look at the, um, uh, the Women's Forum Barometer, and actually I was, quite pleased to see that, and it's, I'm not saying that because I'm French, but to see that in France mm -hmm. is the country in the J20 where actually you have the highest percentage of women in the board of directors. And why it's like that, why it's at 45 and nearly 50 percent, it's because there is a law basically that has imposed that now uh, in the board of directors you need to have, uh, you need to have uh, gender equality. Mm -hmm. so, and I think it's, uh, and I understand in the audience, I understand that sometimes we want to be f faster, but I'm mitigated here while I'm, I'm balanced because, I'm balanced because, again, high adding a regulation, especially in Europe where we have a lot of regulation, um, I'm not sure it will simplify things. Yeah, so if, if, I, if I just use the expression from uh, uh, Women's Forum, it's uh, more name and uh, fame than name and shame. Yeah, exactly. yeah, I like this one. Great. Um, and, and you know, I can only comment on, 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 on what you said about uh, small companies and companies in general. I think from my perspective, uh, there is uh, one thing which is the very beginning, the foundation for companies to, you know, to assess, make their own diagnosis, make a self-evaluation to understand where they are, because it's not easy to evaluate the maturity of our company. That's something we started to do at Lenovo. And that brought, you know, interesting conclusion because, you know, we just realized that we already have strong assets to fight gender bias and to make sure that we produce uh, responsible AI. And we also uh, realized that there were lots of things uh, done around data algorithm, which was made based on common sense from our team. Mm. But common sense is maybe not enough. So we also need to systematize it to, um, uh, to make sure that there is a strong process aligned globally. So that's very, um, um, it, it's, it's an eye opener when you make your self-evaluation and this is from this self-evaluation that you can take clear action because you know exactly where you are. And I think that's probably what we, we need, where we need to encourage all companies here is to make their self-evaluation, honest self-evaluation, and from there build an action plan. And what I want to say as well is that uh, there are examples of best practices from companies here. There are also um, NGOs, organizations, which can help you, you know, to make this self-evaluation, to understand how to take action. Um, would it be Women's Forum? Would it be the Cercle Interrel? So there is a way to do it. So uh, you should ask for help. I in would... Fact, um, can I yeah? just say one thing on the regulation? I wanted to... Because um, I agree with what Olivier is saying, and I hope that uh, Europe you know, can be a, a land of opportunity for AI because there is a, a risk that we become the land of regulation instead of yeah. the land of, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurship. And uh, um, so I do, I do think that there are certain, you know, limits to regulation, for example, on the space of face recognition. It can become, you know, critical, you know, in, uh, uh, in, con in uh, becoming, in limiting the freedom of people, you know, in public spaces, for example, or being controlled where they go, where who the, so that, that's, for me, it's uh, a, a no-go, but uh, uh, in other areas, I think it, it would be better to have some sort of uh, the auditability of the processes and the accountability, but then to um, judge afterwards and not to put a too much regulation, be even before starting doing the first model, because mm -hmm. I would, uh, uh, slow down uh, the, the rate innovation. of uh, innovation that I think we need uh, mm. in Europe. So. Absolutely, you're right. Balancing. I have no idea if we will have time to take a few questions, so maybe if you, some people, yeah, and then maybe we can uh, conclude.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. I'm Adam Levine. I'm from Data4, so full disclosure. Um, I think uh, interesting that Microsoft is in an amazing position here to influence the market. Uh, if you look at sustainability, for example, um, should I take the mic? Say, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> we cannot hear. <laughs> um, sustainability. Microsoft has been a, an industry leader, and it's influenced by uh, you know through the, through the market. It's influenced its suppliers, it's influenced its customers, mm -hmm. and I think it's in a, you know Satya Nadella has uh, been a very uh, has been a, a thought leader on on diversity as well, and I think um, it, other than regulation, which is obviously has its limits. Microsoft is in a position to influence through the market. Um, you RFPs to your suppliers, they should include diversity targets and they, they can be tiebreakers in the event that you have suppliers that have equal opportunity, that have equal criteria mm -hmm. in every other areas. Um, also to your customers and then you could be um, publishing your own diversity numbers on your 10K. And so it becomes a virtuous circle, name and fame, whatever you want to call it, and it, it, it feeds into this positive feedback loop, more diversity, more business. We're fundamentally a capitalist society. Uh, well, I, I do agree. So I, um, we do have a set of practices that are actually quite in line with what was uh, uh, described yesterday in the pledge uh, for you know, what companies and CEOs should stand for in order to promote diversity. And it starts with the CEO taking uh, an active role and advocating for the value of it, so the business case of diversity, as you say, and, and uh, for example, our CEO uh, does it very, very well. And then setting the kind of, uh, um, maybe not targets, but it's an aspiration to be diverse business and setting the processes so that we uh, go forward in that direction. Um, and that is, for example, you know, things such as uh, measuring how many women you have, keeping the leadership team uh, accountable for, you know, getting, it's not, by the way, only women. I mean, we're talking women, but it's also disability, mm. race, uh, all sorts of, I mean, at the end, we are all different from, <laughs> from one side or the other, religion and so on. So um, I think that setting the vision, setting, let's say, accountability for making the workplace more diverse, but then also uh, it's very important to train the managers in order to um, be able to really foster an inclusive uh, environment for working, mm -hmm. because otherwise diversity yeah. gets wasted. Yeah. And, and I like what you said about uh, the ecosystem. So how do we act in our own ecosystem with our customers, suppliers, and make sure that uh, we also ask them what they do on that, on that side. So I, I like right. this one. Maybe we had another question for maybe Olivier. Yes, uh, international, um, and very concerned about these issues. Uh, I was wondering, first of all, I wanted to say Microsoft is an incredible company, and I don't know, but um, they really have shown a real commitment to the ethical issues here. And I'm very concerned about uh, what we call behavioral futures, okay? Yeah. Behavioral futures is what Google and um, a number of other companies uh, and Facebook are collecting of our preferences, both political and marketing, to influence our behaviors in the future. And um, that's actually the gold. <laughs> um, and they're mining us. We're lunch every <laughs> So I'm just wondering uh, what, what Microsoft is doing about this, if they are trying to help uh, get some kind of regulation on this, because this, I do think, has to be regulated. And um, I, I'd love to hear your, your point of view on this. I personally have divested from the, the tech companies that are not behaving responsibly, and I hope everybody else does, too. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, we don't do regulation, right? So, but I, as a, I think this sentiment uh, is um, uh, growingly important, and I think we've seen the impact also on democracy. Uh, and uh, for example, as a as a company, we decided not to um, make a business of the data of our customers, uh, which is a decision that in the short term can. Uh, damage the profits, but in the long term, I think it's just the right one because it creates that kind of independence to make sure that uh, you know, pri uh, privacy is a human right and, uh, um, 
and uh, really having this kind of business model that allows you not to, um, to really go for the benefit of your own customers is super important. I do agree that there is uh, an issue in general for democracy on uh, how um, opinions uh, are formed, and I think it, it is something that as a society we need to, uh, to tackle. I do agree that uh, as uh, you know, uh, individuals first and that companies that these are important issues, then we should uh, um, you know, ask a, a, an important level of accountability on how these things uh, are decided and managed. So I think that's, um, I would agree with you. And maybe, uh, may maybe to conclude, uh, Olivier, a few words also about, you know, positive usage of AI. Maybe that's also uh, something we should uh, Yeah, highlight. for sure. I mean, AI can, uh, the artificial intelligence is, uh, can be very powerful to remove um, um, some, I would say, unfair equality between men and, uh, and uh, women. And actually you can use, and I, I like what uh, I, we, we signed yesterday, this, yeah, the CEO champions uh, commitments. And actually uh, the applications and the tools can help us to commit to our commitments. So basically using AI to uh, remove uh, some bias in the uh, recruitment, but as well in the promotion process. As well, you can use it to find the gaps in salaries between male and female, uh, because we know that it's happening. We've, we've, you can find as well gaps, for example, in the annual reviews uh, of the salaries between male and female. So basically, we can use the technology to identify uh, mm. if you have some unfair uh, approaches in your company Uh, mm. thanks to, uh, to the AI applications. And that's, that's uh, a positive way to, uh, yeah, to sure. use AI uh, to, co to come back to your, to balance to your comment, which is also true. Uh, Sylvia, as a, as a conclusion, is there also something you want to, to add? I think, you know, um, in this topic of AI, sometimes you can get into the fear. I think the point is that uh, AI, I, I, I really have hope that AI will help us to solve uh, some uh, you know incredible challenges that we have that just think about sustainability you know how do we solve the climate uh, problem that we've not been able to solve in the last 10 years, i mean uh, 100 years so we really need to have uh, superpowers to get to the solution so i think that's a positivity um, but i think that somehow technology is going faster than our you know human skills and competencies that have gone so it's really time to make sure that the, the both parts, the tech and the, and the human capital uh, evolve at the same, space, same rate uh, and that we keep up uh, to keep it uh, um, human-centered. Mm -hmm. But I'm hopeful. Yeah, thank, thank you, Sylvia. And on my side, you know, I would like to conclude on the fact that we are all accountable on that topic. Would it be as individuals? Would it be as members of our companies? So, and we can do things about that. So we, we can take concrete action. Um, sometimes we don't know where to start, but there is a way to start. There is a way to take action concretely. So I would just encourage you all in the audience to take your part of this action. Um, and um, that would be, you know, the way to conclude this, uh, this round table. And uh, I would like to thank you very much, uh, Olivier, Sylvia, for your testimony. And I hope uh, you have a good rest of the day. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you. picture <laughs> uh, in front or oops <laughs> <laughs>